A major part of that equation is making sure that veterans has the best possible experience wherever they access VA benefits and services, at home, in the community, or from us at VA. That's why we're meeting vets where they are, expanding telehealth and teleappeals by supporting and by supporting caregivers. Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Alex Horton, a national security reporter here at The Post. And this morning we're talking about veterans care, veterans issues they face, and the uh, issue of reliable internet access uh, that may exacerbate those issues. And joining me today is the man responsible for addressing those issues, Veterans Affairs Secretary Dennis McDonough. Mr. Secretary, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thanks for having me, Alex. I think you left out two important bio uh, uh, facts for you, which is one, that you're a vet yourself, and two, that you're a former VA employee. We, we could not be more proud of your association with us uh, over time. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, maybe it's a, it's a good and bad thing when I cover VA that I know a little bit about the inside baseball that goes on in the building. So I appreciate <laughs> I that. Think good, uh, I don't think it's a <laughs> Yeah, to, to start uh, yesterday, Senator Bob Dole passed away. Uh, and as you know, you know, this is someone before he was a statesman, before he was a senator and, and presidential candidate. This was an army officer left for dead on the Italian battlefield in 1945. And his war wounds played a significant role, not only in his, his public life, but his private life as well. I wanted to, to hear from you in your, your first public remarks about uh, Mr. Dole. Uh, just tell a little bit about, you know, his, his role in the community uh, for veterans and his role in public life. Well, he is, uh, was an amazing statesman, as you said, a, a great senator, uh, decorated soldier, highly regarded vet, and a tireless defender of VA. And so we uh, came to rely on him a great deal over his time in public service. I actually came to rely on him a great deal uh, privately, personally. Uh, we stayed in good touch uh, over the years uh, when I was in the White House. Uh, and even over the course of the last year, as I've been in this job, both uh, with him uh, directly, given how much he cares about VA, but also with his amazing wife, Senator Elizabeth Dole, who is an tireless champion, as we said yesterday, for caregivers, herself having been a caregiver these last many years, um, as well as a great partner for VA. And so the Dole family have been um, absolute uh, rocks for us. So we're going to miss Senator Bob Dole uh, a great deal. And uh, I take, however, great solace from the fact that uh, I think we're stronger as a result of his support for us and the lessons that he taught me personally. Great. So, so moving on, the access to uh, veterans care is probably one of the most significant things that you hear about. You know, when I think about veterans care, I think about three words, access, access, and access. Um, and that's probably the, the the biggest gripe I hear among veterans when they talk about VA care. Um, and one of the issues that, that you're tasked with with taking on is internet access itself um, when it comes to, you know, as we described, the digital divide at the top. Um, so yes. as a department, as an agency tasked with finding new and innovative ways to, to care for veterans, how do you approach the digital divide? What are some of the challenges posed? And how are some of those challenges met in this you know, post-COVID world? 
Yeah, so there's a the, a couple of uh, major challenges. One is obviously the fact that we have a the, our caregivers uh, or our healthcare providers there are not they're not evenly spread across the country. Uh, it's what we say kind of lumpy. We have big concentrations of healthcare providers in different places. This is true of every healthcare system. So, for example, that's a challenge for us in VA because we have a lot of rural veterans living in rural communities, and not just VA, but in fact, the entire American healthcare system faces challenges with shortages of healthcare providers in rural communities. So, one of the ways we address that by is by uh, dramatically expanding since the start of the pandemic telehealth. Now, telehealth can mean anything from actually getting on the phone with your healthcare provider to getting on a screen, uh, as you and I are now uh, on the screen, with on my end, uh, if I were the vet, would be a healthcare provider, and then there'd be a specialist on the other end. We have seen an explosion in the use of telehealth during the period of the pandemic. In March 2020, there have, were about 2,500 telehealth appointments a day. By one year later, March 2021, there were 45,000 telehealth appointments a day. That's a massive expansion. And the good news is it uh, allows us to meet our veterans where they are, including in rural communities, and it allows us to get them uh, <clears throat> specialists and expertise directly with them. Two last points. I was in Kansas with Senator Moran uh, very early in my tenure as, se as Secretary of VA. And I was talking to a veteran who was talking about the care, the mental health care that he was receiving. And he made the point that because of telehealth, he was able to get access to a mental health care professional in Manhattan. And it wasn't Manhattan, Kansas. It was Manhattan, New York City. And that's the beauty of telehealth, because we have concentrations of healthcare providers in places, and the telehealth vehicle allows us then to bring that directly to our veterans wherever they are. Last point. There's a major challenge in all of this, which is beyond our control, which is access uh, to um, uh, 5G or access to broadband. This is why we are so excited about the president's infrastructure plan. And we're so grateful that the Department of Commerce under the leadership of Secretary Raimundo is going to make sure that once and for all, we solve this digital divide. Once we're in that position, then there'll be no limitations on our telehealth capabilities. And we'll be in a position where we can actually reach vets no matter where they are, even in those uh, very rural settings where they don't even have access to broadband. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's where the the, the the problem intersects, right? When you talk about access and these rural veterans, but yes. you know, when you when you talk about you know expanding telehealth, expanding these resources, you are also meeting veterans already predisposed to such things, right? You're 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 expanding yes. to veterans who have access to the internet already, or they have an understanding of technology enough to get on their phone and and talk to their their VA doctor, you know, uh, on on FaceTime. Um, but there is still that gap. Right when you're not going to be able to reach veterans unless there's very deliberate targeted resources because they're not going to have internet at home, they're not going to have access to cell towers. Uh, so what are you doing to reach those those veterans who are really at the heart of this that are in these Wi-Fi deserts? They're in these cell tower deserts where you know getting to them and even hearing them from the first place is the challenge. Yeah, look, I think you're absolutely right, Alex. The you know, so there are a lot of places where that vet could not, uh, because of lack of broadband, cannot uh, connect irrespective of uh, whatever capability we have on our end until Secretary Mundo uh, and the president get this all done. Um, so what are we doing in the meantime? This is where our partnerships become so important. And this is where 
our community-based outpatient clinic network become so important. We have, you know, around 1,100 community-based outpatient clinics across the country, including in rural areas. And the important part of that is uh, that means that a veteran from highly rural settings may still have to try, <laughs> drive a long way, uh, maybe even more than an hour. Um, and then they get they, they can uh, see one of our uh, primary care physicians or providers in that CBOC, and then from there actually get access to specialists across the country. So that's one way through our, our uh, CBOX. The second way is through our partnerships with people like the VFW and the American Legion uh, and different colleges and universities where we have remote access points for care. Uh, the third is the relationship that we have with community providers. We, uh, Congress enacted something called the Mission Act several years ago. The Mission Act sets, cert sets certain uh, limits that says, for example, uh, if a veteran cannot get access to a primary care physician within 20 days, then he can be referred to community care. If a veteran can't get access to a specialist within 28 days, he can be referred to community care. Or if the veteran has a particularly long drive, to get access to any care uh, in the direct VA system, then he can get referred uh, to the community uh, providers in his uh, community. Those are the three ways we do this, uh, Alex. Um, we're looking at this really hard right now for a lot of different reasons. And this, I mean, looking at access for rural veterans and highly rural veterans. We've been looking at it because of questions of vaccination. In this case, we brought the COVID vaccine to those communities uh, through our mobile units. Uh, we're also looking at this because we're taking a hard look at our infrastructure, our physical infrastructure across the country uh, for a requirement that Congress put on us for what we call the Asset and Infrastructure Re Review Commission. So we're taking a hard look at what is available in rural communities for our veterans. And one of the things we're learning in that is uh, we, in many cases, are the only provider even through our CBOX, for example, in highly rural areas. And that makes us a key backbone for healthcare for veterans, to be certain, but also for non-veterans. And we've seen this now throughout the pandemic, where we've made access to our facilities, uh, even for non-veterans, a priority during COVID. We've uh, provided access uh, to some 500 civilians during the course of the pandemic into our hospitals and our clinics so that they can get emergency care in the context of, of COVID-19. All of these questions kind of point up the central point, uh, which I think we're trying to make throughout this pandemic, which is we are a fundamental safety net for healthcare access for veterans first and foremost, but it's turning out we're a really important player for access to health care for non-veterans in rural communities as well. Uh, that's something we're very proud of, and it's something that I hope Congress takes into consideration as we're looking at questions of budgeting and access going forward. So turning to a, a subject that, you know, maybe some people would say internet access is too much of a, of a good thing, and that's uh, disinformation that's targeting veterans. Yes. Um, yes. And and the reason why folks target veterans, uh, you know, it's so easy a troll farmer in Belarus can figure it out. Is you know, veterans are respected in their communities. They uh, have a lot of social interactions, and they bring a lot of people with them when it comes to yes. their uh, their opinions and and their stature in the community. Uh, so there have been congressional hearings. There have been reports issued by VSOs like Vietnam Veterans of America that talked about this issue um, and the lack of. Uh, U.S. government response in the last couple of years. Uh, last year, when I asked the VA about this and what they were doing, especially going into the election, when we knew foreign adversaries and others were seeking to target veterans with disinformation and, and political chaos, 
uh, VA took a back seat to this in the last administration. This this effort was led by the Department of Homeland Security instead to put out you know notices and information for veterans to to make sure they're aware. Now this is something that came up earlier this year uh, when you're at the White House. You told uh, reporters that you'll quote take a look at that um, when it comes to what VA's role is, if any, when it comes to this issue. So it's been a few months. What have you taken a look at and, and what can you uh, describe here? Yeah, well, thanks, Alex, very much for that. Uh, I just want to double down on the, your first kind of overriding analytic point, which is um, veterans are pillars in their communities across the country. We see this in a lot of different ways. I think we've seen it in the course of the last two months in particular on this issue of uh, resettling Afghan refugees into the United States, where uh, in many communities across the country, the leading advocates for that resettlement effort have been veterans. Uh, I'm very proud of that and most importantly, very impressed by it. Uh, but it does speak to your first point, which is that veterans are leaders in their communities, bedrocks in their communities. Uh, and that's why this question of ensuring that veterans have access to good, sound data uh, and information is super important. So that's what we've uh, underscored is our first and most important effort, which is we want to be a clearinghouse for information about uh, questions for veterans from healthcare to benefits to questions around whether we identify efforts by somebody trying to mislead veterans. So that's the first and most important thing we can do is we maintain our uh, posture here as a veteran focused organization focused on nothing other than that not on politics, not on other debates, focused on provision of the best possible care to veterans, including then uh, warning when we see potential problems. That's the first thing we can do. Secondly, we've been very active participants in the interagency group that the White House has stood up. This has been very uh, big priority for the president and for the National Security Council leadership. Uh, we've been very active participants in that process where not just DHS, but DOD has taken a, a strong role in looking at how can they protect the active duty force. Now, we've uh, underscored in the context of that working group uh, two important things. One I just made, which is that we will continue to be a uh, unrivaled, uh, completely apolitical source of information for veterans. And two is we're not going to get between our veterans and their health care providers. So veterans can have every confidence that when they come to us to ask questions about uh, issues that they're facing as it relates to anything, mental health, if it relates to concerns they have about what they're seeing in their community, they know that they can have that, that communication with their health care provider without fear of it being used in any other way. Uh, so those are the two big things that we're focused on, Alex, which is one, how can we maintain uh, our role as a trusted source of good, sound information, including where necessary warnings for veterans? And then two, how is it that we're going to make sure that veterans have every confidence in that context when they come to us that we will not get between them and their health care providers? They'll get all the support they need including, by the way, if they feel like they're getting uh, pressured or recruited from somewhere uh, somewhere else. Great, and, and turning to uh, the issue of veteran suicide, which is especially pernicious given some of the unique ways, you know, our community, um, you know, interacts with things like firearms. Um, you know, as you know from VA data that uh, when it comes to choosing a lethal means uh, for suicide, uh, veterans overwhelmingly choose firearms. It's because they're familiar with them. It's because they're more yeah. likely to own them. Uh, and in the last 20 years, suicide by firearm uh, has gone down when it comes to civilians, men and women both. For veterans, it's up. For women veterans, it's way up. 13% uh, increase in veteran suicide among women using firearms in the last 20 years. So this is a problem. It's an urgent problem, and it's a problem that's getting worse under VA. Yes. And VA has not been able to address this issue. So what are you doing in your agency? What are you doing uh, at the secretary level on down 
to finally get this address to finally address this problem and get it under control. Yeah. So I, let me let me uh, have lethal means last in a, in a three step uh, answer, um, Alex. One, um, you you are right that the problem is huge, and you are you are right that it's far too big. Any one death by suicide from a veteran is one too many. Um, I do want to just contest a little bit that we've not seen anything that's reducing that. We just put out the numbers a couple months ago of the transition from 2018 to 2019 numbers. We saw a reduction for the first year in about 10 years that uh, in that time period, uh, about 630 or so fewer deaths by suicide. I'm not saying it because I think we've done enough. I'm just saying that that directionally is an important first step. By no means enough of a, uh, enough of a step. We're going to get to zero here, but uh, that's an important directional change. And so I just want to get put that out there as a source of hope. Second, we are underscoring through a lot of our programming, including by making sure that veterans in an emergency situation can see a mental health care professional that day. In an urgent situation, we're beating uh, in terms of access to mental health care provider. We're beating the, the kind of the uh, standard, which is two days. We're even through, throughout the pandemic in an urgent rather than emergency situation, urgent situation, we're getting veterans into care uh, in two days or less. Um, and so that involves increasing access points. We talked about telehealth a minute ago. It also involves making sure that we reduce the stigma associated with, se with seeking help. And the fact is that all of us seek mental health care. It's a uh, highly logical uh, thing when one is worried about uh, whole health. And it's highly logical that one may find himself struggling a bit, if particularly in the course of the pandemic when we find ourselves isolated or anxious. And so this question of access is a question of us having providers. It's a question of us having avenues for veterans to get that uh, access. But then it's an also uh, a societal challenge for all of us to underscore that there's no weakness in seeking that access, which then brings me to the third point, which is lethal mean safety. We're very familiar with the data that you ticked off very sadly, Alex, but that's why we have uh, in the context of our work here at VA over the course of the last three months, dramatically ramped up our lethal means safety training. That comes in a lot of different forms from uh, television advertisements, uh, where we are out very aggressively in the market at the moment, to social media and earned media interaction, like this one, by the way, where we urge uh, veterans to come take a look at va.gov and hear from us about various lethal means safety steps we can take, including by giving access uh, to firearm locks. We've seen as a result, just in these first couple of months of this communications effort, uh, dramatic uptake in terms of uh, interaction with our social media posts on this, for example, of more than a billion uh, interactions, but importantly, that's concretely leading to uh, interaction with us on things like coming to get um, a firearm lock. And the point here is exactly the point you made in your lead in, Alex, which is oftentimes suicidal ideation comes in a flash. And what we want to make sure is in that moment, there's some distance from uh, that moment of acute um, desperation, for example, and access to a firearm. And so our training is all around trying to distance that moment, as I say, from that uh, moment of acute ideation. Um, we want to distance that from access to a firearm. There's two ways to do that. One is through the lethal, lethal means safety programming that we have. And then the other is through another public affairs campaign we have, which is now. Uh, we're urging families and veterans alike, even if you're not in a period of crisis, to make a plan 
for the event that a crisis comes along. Um, we're saying don't wait, reach out. Come see us, uh, even just come visit our website, va.gov slash mental health, and see all the kinds of information that we have available so you can plan for that eventuality. Um, we think that these are some very concrete steps, and I hope that these concrete steps lead to an intensification of the process of the progress that we saw from 2018 to 2019. Um, and we're not going to rest until we get to zero, Alex. All right, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think that's a great point to leave that. Um, thank you for joining Washington Post Live. Um, and we appreciate your presence here. Thank you very much. I, you know, I know, Alex, one thing you've uh, really been focused on is made your fish back. And it's one of the things that I'm very, very much focused on, too. And um, I know that you're uh, looking hard into this. This is, a court, this, of course, a case of uh, intense interest here as any case uh, of a veteran who seeks uh, care is. Um, but I just wanted to underscore that uh, my appreciation for you to continue uh, looking at that. I know you're in touch with our people, and I think it's a really important story for you to get to the bottom of. Yeah, I appreciate that, and we'll look for for ways to to describe to the public what 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 challenges lie ahead for veterans, what what uh, what good things they can find at VA, but also you know your your very serious responsibility in getting veterans the timely and access care that they deserve to to prevent the next death, the next suicide, the next uh, needless suffering. Uh, you know, VA is here to help, and and we're we're uh, amen. We're we're sure to help you. Uh, uh, you know, get to the get to the bottom of that too. So I appreciate your time here, sir. Thanks so much, Alex. I appreciate you all very much. Bye now. All right, that was VA Secretary Dennis McDonough. Uh, coming up, we have Robin Kelleher. She's the CEO for Hope for the Warriors, and she's joining us next. Please stay tuned. I first heard about Internet Essentials after leaving the military. I went from being active duty to being a college student, to now being a engineer. Having Internet Essentials ultimately helped me pursue my career in engineering. Comcast is supporting veterans in a major way by providing this program, and it worked out because I landed my dream job, and it's been a growing force in the veterans community locally. Hello everyone, I'm Ruth Umo, Editor-in-Chief at The Filament. Whether it's remote learning or telehealth, digital connectivity can be transformative for veterans and military families. Joining me today is Broderick Johnson, Executive Vice President of Public Policy and Executive Vice President of Digital Equity at Comcast to discuss the company's commitment to serving those who serve our country by providing access to fast internet. Welcome, Broderick. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, let's delve right into things. As you know, since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have witnessed this monumental shift to the digital world from education to health to work. The list goes on. What can we do to ensure that our nation's veterans can access the tools and opportunities that are available to them online? Well, Ruth, services like telehealth and remote learning have become necessities during the pandemic, and they will remain popular and critically important in the years to come. At Comcast, we've been focused on keeping veterans connected at home for some time. In 2018, for example, Comcast announced what was then the second largest expansion of our Internet Essentials program in its history to include low-income veterans. Internet Essentials is the largest, most comprehensive internet adoption program in the entire United States, connecting over 10 million people in 10 years. And Internet Essentials has cost the same since it began in 2011, just $9.95 per month. We also offer heavily subsidized laptop computers to use at home. The federal government's Emergency Broadband Benefit, or EBB, now provides eligible customers with a, with a subsidy that covers the cost of internet essentials. And part of the recently enacted bipartisan infrastructure bill will replace the pandemic era EBB program and make direct broadband subsidies to households permanent. Our company's commitment to connecting veterans helps veterans connect to vital services already available to them. 
In fact, the vast majority of telehealth visits made by veterans are now originating from their homes. That represents a market shift. Prior to the pandemic, telehealth visits often meant traveling from one VA facility to another. And it's not just telehealth. With more and more schools offering virtual options to earn degrees and certifications, veterans can use their internet to take advantage of their own educational benefits granted under the GI Bill by taking courses online. So the real life impact can be so transformative, Ruth. As you alluded to, your main goal is to provide folks with at-home internet access, which is why this program is so aptly named. But what can be done to reach veterans at other locations, such as community centers? Well, Ruth, we know that it's important for veterans to be able to access the internet when they're outside of their homes too, as there are many veteran-serving organizations across the country that help veterans do such things as apply for their benefits, navigate career services, and get access to mental health services. At Comcast, our initiative to reach people with free internet outside of the home is called Lift Zones. We announced the rollout of Lift Zones in 2020 with an initial goal of helping students attend virtual school and to get their homework done in community centers near them. Our Lift Zones, combined with our Internet Essentials Program, are two major programs that are part of Project UP which is our company's new comprehensive initiative to advance digital equity further and to help build a future of unlimited possibilities. We're investing enormous resources behind Project UP with a $1 billion commitment to reach 50 million people. And just last week, we announced that we'll install free Wi-Fi in up to 100 veteran-focused facilities as we continue to bring more community organizations online with fast, free internet. We've already installed nearly 25 lift zones inside veteran serving organizations, and we'll continue to work closely with our partners and veterans and military communities to map out additional locations over the next several months. For example, we're installing a lift zone at a veterans leadership program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, an organization that empowers thousands of veterans annually to reach their fullest potential from housing to career development. There are many organizations that we're working with, and we look forward to expanding that list, connecting veterans where they are and through organizations that they already trust is of utmost importance to us at Comcast as well. Absolutely. Collaboration will certainly be critical in narrowing the digital divide. Although Comcast is currently fo focusing much of its efforts on digital equity, it also has a history of supporting veterans and military families in other capacities. Before we go, tell us a, a bit about said commitments. Well, our company's connection to veterans goes all the way back to our late founder, Ralph Roberts, who was a United States Navy veteran who served during the Second World War. Comcast NBC Universal believes in creating an inclusive workplace that values the skills and the experiences of those in the military community. This is anchored by our company's commitment to hire 21,000 veterans, National Guard members and Reserve Service members, and military spouses. Today, in fact, over 17,000 have joined the Comcast NBC Universal team. We also have unique programs to support our employees who currently serve, including our military concierge service which is a team dedicated to help employees navigate benefits, pay, and other services when they're called to active duty, and also to be there for them when they return to Comcast NBC Universal. We're also honored to partner with organizations that support the military community to help advance their missions. In fact, since 2011, we provided nearly $200 million in cash and in-kind contributions to these organizations. As part of the Comcast RISE program, we're also assisting veteran-owned small businesses hit hard over the past two years. And finally, Comcast NBC Universal recognizes that the U.S. military reflects the American people, and we honor people of all genders, races, ethnicities, and backgrounds for their service to our nation. I think that's a solid place to end. Uh, certainly comprehensive initiatives that other companies can mirror. Broderick, thank you so much for your time and your deep insights. And I'll now hand things back over to the Washington Post.
Welcome back to Washington Post Live. I'm Alex Horton, a national security reporter here at The Post. And up next, we have Robin Keller. She is the CEO and founder of Hope for the Warriors. It is a nonprofit group that helps military families, veterans, and service members make that transition and reintegration back into civilian life. Robin, welcome to Washington Post Live. Good morning. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate you having us on the show this morning. Well, first, before we get into some of these issues, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the founding of your group. Uh, you know, at Camp Lejeune in 2006, you know, a lot has happened with the military and a lot has happened with veterans issues since then. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about, um, you know, the, the the spark that led to your group's founding um, and some of the, uh, the evolutionary steps. What are some of the ways that uh, you identify these issues and, um, and how have you tackled them so far? Absolutely. Thank you. So, yes, uh, almost 16 years ago, Hope for the Warriors was founded uh, here aboard Camp Lejeune. I happen to be here today uh, for a very exciting moment in our history as part of a grand opening for the Cohen Veteran Network uh, Mental Health Clinic here in Jacksonville. Uh, 16 years ago, however, there weren't the kind of resources that we're seeing now and the kind of momentum that we just heard from the secretary uh, and from Comcast. Um, so it was really military families really coming together to recognize the needs and the challenges that we were having, to talk about them, to be a voice for each other, and to do the actual work. Um, I can say I did not aspire to be the CEO of a nonprofit organization, um, but I did aspire to take care of military families the way that I had promised when I was married into the military. Uh, and as a daughter of uh, two soldiers, have lived that life myself. Um, so throughout the last 16 years, we have met our service members and their families where they're at. And it isn't always easy. There are remote locations, they go back home. Um, there's the communities that don't have the kind of resources that are critical for the thriving of our military families. And so we very quickly recognized that mental health issues were what was tearing our military families apart and thought where could we be innovative and start changing the course of this mental health crisis. And so we, start, we started with some very uh, unique internship partnerships with many incredible universities across the country, um, providing internships for their mental um, uh, social work students, allowing them the experience uh, of military cultural competency training and also accessing military families. So in 2012, we became very virtually uh, accessible by our military families, knowing that we needed to meet them where they were at. Um, but the reality is that uh, virtual, virtual connection doesn't take the place of personal connection, but it can be coupled to be a force multiplier with that personal connection. And that is getting out into the communities and recognizing who your military families are, connecting with them, checking in on them, reaching out to them, and reaching out to themselves. So that's the way that careers has addressed our challenges for the last 16 years. Certainly the way that we continue to collaborate with our partners, technology, never getting that personal touch is really the critical. Yeah, and you know, you heard the secretary address some of these issues of you know, there's some opportunities in telehealth to, to reach folks who are who are out there um, and not necessarily able to connect the way that, you know, you and I might do in, in major cities. Um, and, you know, that presents opportunities for you guys to to also reach these folks. Um, but also, you know, there is that that downside to this uh, uh, this dynamic, which is one both that, you know, sometimes an impersonal touch that you mentioned, uh, but also, uh, you know, the, the people who are most at need of help and the the, the most isolated perhaps, you know, aren't no. getting that aren't care and attention. Care. So uh, what, are, what are some of the ways that you've you've overcome this issue, especially, you know, we're dealing with COVID restrictions um, and that personal touch that you mentioned that's so vital that, you know, you might not necessarily get right now. What are some of those ways you've overcome those those barriers? Well, we're still working on overcoming that. I can't say that we've tackled it uh, and 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 uh, you know successfully and um, 
and fix that problem. It's going to be a problem that we will constantly be um, looking to address. But again, getting into communities and people knowing that there is hope out there um, does bring people in. I think one of the most important things that we've seen through the pandemic and also through the situation in Afghanistan was if you just make a phone call to someone and most people do have access to at least a phone um, that you can reach someone and make that personal connection, draw them in um, and start figuring out what is their access, what are their barriers to care? What is the barriers to that access? And sometimes as you know, the secretary said, it's wonderful that we have these VA centers, um, but that drive could potentially be a financial issue for a military family or veteran. And so you've got organizations like Hope for the Warriors that are out there really looking at those minute um, barriers to care and addressing them head on. And so that these global wonderful uh, initiatives can really take effect and um, move through and, and uh, take down those barriers to care. You know, we look at telemental health, such a critical um, component of care. And prior to the pandemic, we couldn't have been, tried to be as loud as we could about, we've got to figure this out and we've got to have a solution to the barriers to telemental health, which we all know there are. Um, there was a, you know, something about the pandemic that was such a positive output was it really placed the emphasis on the importance of access to care virtually. And so we're everybody from the, the state and national level beginning to look at how do we continue to grow that network of care and reduce those barriers, whether it's state licensure or whether it's broadband access. Um, I think the emphasis that's being placed on that is really important. And it is doing a lot to address the stigma as well. The secretary brought that point up. Um, everyone needs a little, a little bit of help every once in a while. Sometimes we need a little more in, in certain periods or per, uh, certain journeys in our life. Uh, it's become a norm, which is critical, uh, and we needed that to happen. So I do say there's so many blessings that we saw in the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing the secretary noted, and, and with respect to him, he, he mentioned the the suicide rate is is down, um, you know, recently, which, you know, as you know, these numbers fluctuate up and down. Um, and this is something that I think, you know, VA and, and the Department of Defense have have uh, that, that they need to address, which is, you know, they, they sort of celebrate quietly when the numbers are down um, and they don't address when the numbers go up. Um, so when it comes to uh, reaching those people. I, I think maybe they have a finger in the dam uh, when it comes to mental health issues, that they're reaching the people who are who are predisposed to, to seeking out care, not necessarily reaching the people who are, you know, hard hard gets or, or people who are resistant to this sort of care and resources. So what are, what are some of the ways that you've been able to, you know, either through technology or, or, or innovative programs, what are some of the ways that you have been able to break through this barrier um, and a lot of, you know, frankly, resistance in our community um, to get care, to get resources, to ask for help. What are some of the ways you guys have tackled that? So we feel very strongly that 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 crisis moment, that trauma moment, um, comes after a long journey of different things, sort of kind of not coming together in your life or falling apart or feeling that way. And so our approach is to really hit that journey running and tackle the issues that lend or lead to that, that moment where somebody makes a life or death choice. And I think that's really important because if you look at financial issues, marital issues, physical issues, employment, all those things, when they're not addressed as a whole person um, solution package, then, then there comes that crisis moment when, of hopelessness. And you know, at Hope for the Warriors, we are, we say that our service members and their families did not go into combat alone. They don't recover alone, but they do commit suicide alone. And so it is critical to check and be a part of that journey and constantly touching and reaching out to people. And it is incumbent for us as those nonprofits that are in the trenches, I say, um, to recognize the personal touch piece. And it's we've got to keep um, pushing that because technology is wonderful. And again, we can use that as a force multiplier, but we have people and we 
and we're working for people and with people. And so as a community, we need to care for each other and constantly be checking in on each other and making sure those alone moments um, are actually filled with hope and not hopelessness. Right, and I'm glad you brought up families because this is an important part of, of veterans care and, and not just military families uh, dealing with deployments or, or coming back from them, but, you know, for the rest of our lives. Like, you know, my grandfather served in the Korean War and every time I have a conversation with him, somehow it leads back to, you know, his time there and his wounds. Um, so, you know, people in this country may think that because troops have left Afghanistan and troops have largely left Iraq and Syria that, these things kind of just go away, but we're talking months, years, decades, you know, in, in 2090, we're going to be talking about veterans issues for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and their families. So families play a huge role in this, uh, as you know. So what are some of the issues facing caregivers? What are some of the issues facing military and veterans families going forward? And how well prepared are these families for the long call of care? That's a great question, Alex, and thank you so much for bringing that up because, again, this organization, Hope for the Warriors, was founded by families because we were absolutely affected um, by deployments and injuries and, and those who gave their lives, everyone sacrificed. Um, so, again, the shared experiences is, a, is such a, a strong bond between military families and keeping military families connected. Um, what we've learned about caregivers and spouses that we did know is that we have a lot of trust in each other. We have a lot of faith in each other. We reach out to each other when we need something because we know the answer, the resource, um, the information that we get is from a trusted source. So recognizing the importance of those, um, those groups and keeping um, caregivers and military families connected with each other is very important. Um, in the school systems, it's critical that uh, leadership in schools recognize who the military children are in their schools and how are they um, ensuring the success of education for military children, because that certainly affects mom and dad at home as well. And so there's, it's just a, it's awareness and an education that we haven't really seen as much because, as you know, it's a small population and Certainly what you just mentioned about your grandfather is, is such a powerful point. He shared those stories with you. Do you think that he shares those stories with just anyone? Probably not because you all have shared experiences. Um, and so I think it's important for the, the general public, but everybody, um, corporations, the government, to understand the culture of the military, because in many ways um, we've worked we're sort of our own downfall in terms of our well-being, uh, you know, not wanting to ask for help, um, making sure that we're taking care of everyone else, making sure that resources go to those who deserve it more. Uh, it's a really interesting um, population to work with uh, and such an honor, of course, but you really got to know who they are and, and what they want and where they're coming from in order to be successful. So, Robin, you, you talked about how, you know, the country has come a long way. Nonprofits have come a long way since your group's founding. Um, and certainly, you know, Pentagon, Department of Defense and, and VA, they're the number one and number two most well-funded federal agencies we have. Uh, and all that being said, you know, right now, families in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor are boiling their water because of a contaminated gas leak that's affecting the, uh, the drinking water supply there. So, Every day there's issues and every day there's something happening with military families and service members and veterans that, you know, there are obvious and glaring gaps when it comes to DOD and, and VA's role here. So where are the shortcomings in these agencies when it comes to, um, you know, the work you do in your communities? Um, where can they make improvements? And, you know, where do you see this relationship going forward when the cameras come down and we stop talking about veterans every day and we already have really to be frank um so in the coming years you know what how are these agencies needing to step up um when it comes to these communities another great question and you know it's interesting because when they get to situations like that and i you know you've referenced um uh the government shutdown a couple years ago really impacted the coast guard families and it was nonprofit organizations out in the community uh, making sure that they had what they needed. Um, 
I think it's so critical to respect and appreciate the work that the nonprofits are doing. Direct service nonprofits are at the forefront of forecasting needs and driving change in this community. And it's important for larger organizations to recognize the value of those partnerships and to listen. Um, we're agile and can move on a dime if you know tomorrow something big breaks in Afghanistan, as we saw earlier um, this fall, we we pivoted our resources to making sure that everyone that was affected by that in our community had somebody call them and touch and reach out and make sure that they were okay. And that's that's pretty significant, um, but it's also something that can be done by a young uh, agile organization and. If you put that in your toolbox as a large government agency, you're really doing a much better service. Um, and we certainly are never gonna stop talking about what we do. So uh, uh, our mission will be in the forefront of for a lifetime because, and I said this at a speech the other night, well, the, the wounded community, the military community has undergone uh, it, you know, issues that has never been seen before. They're lifelong, we will not, um, you know, you process and you and you thrive and continue to thrive, but those experiences don't go away. And what we want them to do is to build better people and significant um, experiences to be, be the betterment of this country. But we have to keep that awareness. Uh, you know, our military and their families and veterans, they're our greatest national security resource, not technology, it's people. And so we've got to keep the emphasis and the focus on those people and, and honor their service, but continue to make sure that they're ready tomorrow to, to take on whatever comes next. We're just about out of time. And I have one, one final question for you when it comes to, to caregivers and, and veterans' families. Uh, you know, we, we talked about mental health um, and the resources are there for, for veterans. Sometimes, you know, they're not good enough or they're not consistent enough, but the resources are there. Something we talk very little about is the the mental health of spouses, children um, dealing with some of these issues in military and veterans families uh, who don't necessarily have those conduits to care. So going forward, you know, what are some of the issues that you see addressing the mental health issues when it comes to military families and veterans families? Um, and you know, what are some of the ways that you know uh, agencies and other nonprofits can step up to fill this gap? Making uh, military spouses and military family members a part of your mission base is is critical. We can't just look at them as just a piece. It is the biggest part of the pie. Um, I, as I mentioned today, I'm here in Jacksonville, North Carolina, the grand opening of the Cohen Veteran Network Mental Health Clinic. This clinic focuses specifically on veterans, military families, and military children. Um, those kinds of resources, there's 20 of these clinics around the country. Um, as an organization, Hope for the Warriors has always put the mental health and the well being of military spouses and children as a priority. Um, they're the last to ask for help, they're the least acknowledged. Um, it is incumbent upon this country to recognize the service of our spouses and our military children um, and to ensure that the resources that they need are provided. Again, by understanding them, the military cultural competency, uh, understanding the experiences and what those needs are. Um, they are the lifeblood of our military. And I can't say it enough that uh, the resources need to be understood and, and be provided. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation is doing a fantastic job. And you know our heart goes out to them today as well. Senator Dole has been a a phenomenal supporter of Hope for the Warriors from the day we started this organization. We work very closely alongside them to help support military spouses and caregivers. Um, there are great organizations all over this country that are really um, banding together to ensure a, uh, a strong network of care and at the national and state level, those need to be recognized and also supported because we also spend a great deal of time raising the money to make sure we're doing the work that we can do um, and putting that money into our programming. And we don't want to be fighting with each other. We want to just be working together as a team. Uh, you know, one team, one fights our, is our motto here. So it's, I, it's incumbent to recognize and appreciate and respect the work that the nonprofits are doing as well. 
All right, that's a great place to leave it, Robin. Uh, fortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I just want to thank you for your your insight, your expertise, and and all the value you bring to you know the veterans community. So we really, really appreciate it. Alex, and thank you for taking the time on this very important topic. You're welcome. And as always, thank you for watching. This has been the Washington Post Live. If you want to check out our other great programs coming up all this week, go to WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Alex Wharton, National Security Reporter here at The Post. Have a good day.